Hello everyone this is part 1 of what if Naruto was the child of the moon in Percy Jackson, this story is made by Royal Bioforge, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Ugh. My head hurts. A blonde-haired boy slowly opens his eye and found himself staring a ceiling he has never seen before. He groggily and slowly sat up to look around and he did not recognize the place he was in. It was a nice room to begin with a cabinet on the side of the room. There was a TV on its stand facing the bed. To the right, there was a nightstand with a lamp on it. Further to the right of the bed, there is a balcony terrace next to the window. He decides to stand up and look around. He checked the cabinet and found clothes that were his size and a bunch of scrolls with notes attached to them. He went to the TV to check it out, but he couldn't figure out how to turn it on not knowing that you have to plug it in first. He went over to the balcony window to look out. What he saw made mind blow. He saw buildings so tall they were poking up the clouds. He saw moving objects that he thought they were carriages pulled by horses, except, the odd thing was there were no horses pulling it. He sat back down on the bed still reeling from all the weird things he saw. He lay back down on the bed a little hard, only to have a note flutter down to his face. He picked it up and read what was written. Dear Naruto, I'm sorry I could not wait for you to wake up, but I'm afraid you cannot see me until the time is right. I know about your childhood and how hard it is to live all alone like that, so I took you in. I'm so sorry I couldn't get you sooner, but you're here now. That is what is important. I can tell you who your parents are though. Your father is the man you have looked up to and have been chasing all your life, Minato Namik is the fourth Hokage of the Leaf. Your mother is Kushina Uzumaki, the former Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Fox. Don't blame them for leaving you on your own. It's not their fault. They died on the day you were born protecting you and the village from the Nine-Tailed Fox's attack. They are heroes. I am telling you this for you to know that you were loved and you were not left alone. This time though I will be watching over you. Well, enough of that, if you didn't notice yet, you are in a different world from where you were. You have to start over again. I have some stuff for you. In the nightstand, there are some books on this world. You will need to read up on them to survive in this world. In the cabinet, you will find some clothes I picked up for you, so you could fit in with the people. There are also scrolls in there to help you in practicing your jutsu. In the drawer of the nightstand, there is some money for you to spend in this world and a map of the city so you can explore. I know you have a lot of questions. I assure you they will be answered in time. You will just have to be patient. Also, kids your age still have to go to school, so I enrolled you to a boarding school, Yancey Academy. I heard you loved learning so I see you would not have a problem with this. Unfortunately, you will have to be careful of using your jutsu out in the open. People in this world have no knowledge of parallel worlds or special powers. That is all for now my boy. Just know that I love you as my own and I will be watching over you. Love. Your new mother. P.S. You will have to brush up on Greek mythology. I guarantee it will come in handy in the future. A single tear ran down the side of his cheek. He was crying tears of joy because this time he felt loved. He was happy to know his parents loved him and didn't abandon him as what the villagers have been telling him all his childhood. He was happy to know that somebody took him in despite his past and how the villagers saw him. He was happy, that this time, he would make new friends without them judging him for what was sealed inside of him. At the same time, he was sad that he had to leave the friends he had already made back in the leaf village. He was scared of what he may face ahead of him. He broke himself out of his thoughts and decided to stand up. He took a deep breath ready to take on this new world he was in. With one big shout, he said. Watch out world because Naruto Uzumaki is here. It was not easy to live in a new world with no idea of what you are doing. The first thing Naruto learned in this new world was to follow the traffic lights. One that one occasion, he was almost hit by a car accidentally because he was reading a book he took a liking to, and he absent-mindedly crossed the street. Thankfully, he heard the car's horn at the last second and was able to get out the way. It took him a few weeks to adjust and to learn about this new world. He gained a lot of knowledge due to his love of reading books. 
He discovered that he loved learning and buried himself in a lot of books from this world, but he quickly learned that he couldn't sit on one spot for prolonged periods. He would find a lot of time passed by when he was reading. On the other hand, when he was not doing anything, time seemed to be at a standstill. Although he read a lot, he never forgot to keep up with his training. His chakra control massively increased and could tree climb and water walk like it was second nature. He also increased his sensory range by channeling chakra all throughout his body. When he joined Yancey Academy, he was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, ADHD, which explains why he could not stand still and why time was a passing by slowly when he was not doing anything. The guidance counselors placed him in the sixth grade which was where kids his around his age were usually at. As for his room, he was placed in a room with a 12-year-old boy with black hair and sea-green eyes. This is Percy Jackson. He quickly learned that Percy also had ADHD and that he has dyslexia. Percy lives in the same part of the city as Naruto. He found out that Percy had been kicked out of every private school that he had been enrolled in due to a series of unfortunate events that happened in every school he was in. His other roommate was a scrawny kid who must have been held back several grades. This is Grover Underwood. Grover is a disabled kid with a muscular disease in his legs causing him to be crippled all his life. He had a note to excuse him from PE for the rest of his life. Although, Naruto and Percy swears he could run so fast when it was enchilada day in the cafeteria. The three of them quickly became friends and were inseparable ever since. The two boys have been protective over Grover due to him being picked on by bullies. When someone tried to bully Grover, Percy always had to pick a fight with the bullies. Naruto, on the other hand, always seemingly keeps his cool whenever Grover gets bullied. Most of the time, Grover's prankers always found themselves on the wrong end of a prank whenever they tried to pick on him. On one occasion, there were two bullies who tried stealing his lunch money. The next day, these two boys woke up only to find themselves hanging from the flagpole by their underwear while the national anthem was playing. Everyone in the school could not figure out who the mysterious pranker was, but Percy and Grover had a sneaking suspicion that their roommate was the one responsible for the pranks because whenever they asked him if he heard of the pranks, he would have a gleam in his eyes. In their stay at Yancey Academy, Naruto, being an avid reader, aced his subjects, while Percy managed to get C's and D's despite his dyslexia due to Naruto's help. Naruto practically enjoyed every class he attended and managed to ignore his urges to get up and move about, but Percy just couldn't stand sitting in class and had a hard time reading. When Naruto wasn't studying, he would sneak out of his room to go out and train. He would just leave out a clone to stay in the room to avoid suspicion and help Percy study. He absolutely loved it when he was outside at night. He felt warm under the glow of the moon, like someone's arms were wrapping around him. He also feels like someone was watching over him as he trained. The days went by pretty much the same as always. Naruto continued to ace his classes due to his love of learning. His jutsu also managed to improve his control on the wind element and decided to start learning how to use fire chakra. Percy got into a lot of trouble because he kept on picking fights with the bullies who picked on Grover. This caused him to be on probation, which meant one more incident would cause him to get expelled. The days went on just like before until one day, Mr. Brunner announced they would be going on a field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts. Mr. Brunner was this middle-aged man in a motorized wheelchair who always wore a frayed tweed jacket. He had thinning hair and a scruffy beard, and he always smelled like coffee. To most of the class, he didn't seem cool, but to Naruto and Percy, he was awesome and the best teacher in the school. He always told jokes and stories in class and even made them play games. Both Naruto and Percy could not wait for this event. At the same time, Percy had his fingers crossed that the trip would go well because of his previous bad track record of ruining school trips. Naruto, on the other hand, was determined to learn a lot on this trip and, of course, keep his friend out of any more trouble. On the way to the museum, the trip started out without a hitch, and Percy was determined to have normal trip without anything bad, embarrassing or even mildly entertaining happened on the trip. Well, at least that is what he thought. On the way to the museum, Nancy Bobofit, a freckly, red-headed and kleptomaniac girl, decided to pick on Grover. She kept throwing chunks of her peanut butter and ketchup sandwich at Grover. I'm going to kill her, Percy mumbled. Grover tried to calm his friend down to prevent him from picking a fight with Nancy. It's okay. I like peanut butter. 
he said while dodging another piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it, Percy said as he started to get up, only to be pulled back to his seat by Grover. You're already on probation, Grover reminded. You know who'll get blamed if anything happens. Yeah, besides some kind of miracle might happen, Naruto said with a familiar gleam in his eyes which his friends noticed. He turned around to glare at Nancy, only to have her blush at him. Despite what people think of Nancy, deep inside, she was still a girl and couldn't help but blush whenever Naruto looks her way. Fine, Percy said with a sigh, but he couldn't help but think what the mysterious pranker had planned today. M-E-T-R-O-P-O-L-I-T-A-N-T Museum of Art. When the group arrived at the museum, Grover and Mr. Brunner's face seemed to light up as they approached. It was Mr. Brunner who led the tour into the museum. Another teacher, Mrs. Dodds, followed the group and acted as chaperone. Mrs. Dodds, was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a leather jacket, despite her age of 50. She came around the halfway point of the school year when the previous math teacher had a nervous breakdown. So, Mr. Brunner led the group through the big echoey hallways of the museum, past paintings of different people, marble statues of the gods and a glass case of really old pottery. The first stop on their tour was at a bronze chariot that was enlaced in ivory. Mr. Brunner went on to explain that the chariot was created by the Athena and Poseidon. Apparently, Athena created the chariot, while Poseidon supplied the horses. At the mention of Athena, Naruto had a tingling sensation, like he was supposed to know something. Naruto was broken out of his thoughts when Percy leaned on over and whispered something to his ear. I bet it would be awesome to race them around Central Park. Sounds fun and dangerous he he he. Naruto whispered back. Both boys gave each other a fist bump, while Grover sighed while looking at the boys with worry. Gods, these two will be the death of me. Keep up, honeys. Mrs. Dodds said sweetly to both boys, which broke them out of their conversation, only to see that they were lagging a bit behind. For the next hour, Mr. Brunner took the group throughout the whole museum. He explained the different armors of Greek and Roman origin and different strategies used in the different battles during the olden times. Naruto and Percy recognized some of the paintings that Mr. Brunner told them about in class. There was one of Hercules fighting the Nemean lion. There was another of Jason sailing across the Atlantic in his ship, the Argo. Yet another one was a painting depicting the large wooden horse that the Greeks used in Trojan War. At their last stop, Mr. Brunner gathered the class around a 13-foot-tall stone column with a sphinx on top. He explained that it was a grave marker, a stele, for a girl their age. He also told them about the carvings on the side. Naruto, Percy and Grover tried to listen to Mr. Brunner but everyone else around them was talking so Naruto and Percy took turns telling people to shut up. Every time they told someone off though, Mrs. Dodds had an evil look on her face and was staring at the three boys. Mr. Brunner kept talking about Greek funeral art when Nancy Bobofitz snickered something loudly, about a naked guy on the stele. Percy got fed up and told her off, will you shut up? Only this time it was a little louder than he meant to causing the whole group to laugh and Mr. Brunner to stop his story. Mr. Jackson, do you have a question? Mr. Brunner asked Percy whose face was turning red from embarrassment. And no sir, Percy managed to mumble out causing more snickers to come out from Nancy's group. Naruto glared at the group causing Nancy to get flustered and turn pink all over her face. Mr. Brunner pointed to one of the pictures on the stele, well then, perhaps you can tell me what this picture represents. Percy looked at the carving and was relieved that he knew what it was. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes, Mr. Brunner said obviously not satisfied with answer. And he did this because. Well, Percy racked his brain to remember. Kronos was the king god and. God, Mr. Brunner asked. Titan, Percy corrected. And he didn't trust his kids who were the gods. So, um, he ate them, right? but his wife hid baby Zeus, and gave Kronos a rock to eat instead. And later, when Zeus grew up, he tricked his dad Kronos into barfing up his brothers and sisters. UW, said the girls listening behind them. Then there was a big fight, and the gods won. Percy continued earning a nod of approval from Mr. Brunner. That's correct, he said. Then the world came to be ruled by the twelve Olympian gods, with the most powerful being the three brothers, Zeus, Poseidon and Hades. Ever since. Ever since they started to rule, the gods came down to earth in order to hook up with mortals because they couldn't keep it in their pants. Naruto spoke up, earning a round of laughter from the group. 
That is correct, Mr. Uzumaki. Can you tell me the correct term for these children the gods have with mortals? He asked Naruto as he studied him with amused eyes. Demigods, he answered. Part mortal, part god. Can you name some of them, then? Mr. Brunner asked. Um. Naruto tried to think. Well there were Hercules and Perseus who were sons of Zeus, he looked at his fright as he said the latter knowing that he was named after him. Plus there was Theseus who was a son of Poseidon. He continued. That's correct, very good Mr. Uzumaki. It's good to see you are listening in class. At the back of the group, Nancy mumbled to her friends, like we are going to use this in real life. Like it's going to say on our job applications, please explain why Kronos ate his kids. As if on cue, Mr. Brunner asked, and why, to paraphrase M's Bobo Fitz's excellent question, does this matter in real life? Do you know Mr. Jackson? Busted, Grover muttered with a smirk on his face. Percy tried to think, but could not come up with an answer, I'm sorry sir. I don't know. I see. Mr. Brunner looked disappointed, but his eyes lit up again when he saw Naruto raise his hand. Sir, I guess it's because we can learn from the past mistakes of the gods in order for us not to repeat them. Naruto said. Mr. Brunner smiled. Full credit for you, Mr. Uzumaki, half credit for you, Mr. Jackson. On that note, I believe it is lunch time. Mrs. Dodds, will you lead us outside? Naruto followed the group, but Percy was pulled aside by Mr. Brunner so he could talk to him. Naruto and Grover looked back to him, and Percy mouthed, I'll see you outside. The two boys nodded and headed for the exit with the group. On another part of the exhibit where there were statues of the Olympian gods, Naruto saw some of them in the corner of his eyes. Curiosity got the better of him, so he entered the room and marveled at the statues he was seeing in front of him. He looked around the room and saw a store of a beautiful woman wearing a dress that stopped just above her knee and was holding a bow in one hand and an arrow on the other hand. He spotted a plaque in front of the statue, and he read it. Naruto couldn't help but feel familiarity as he was looking at the statue, like all those times he was training out in the open at night as he was bathed in the moonlight. The statue's gaze just felt like all those times. He was broken out of his thoughts when Mr. Brunner wheeled in next to him. Artemis, Mr. Brunner said. Goddess of the hunt, moon, childbirth, wild animals and chastity. He he, sorry for getting separated from the group Mr. Brunner. I just got curious of the statues in here. I felt like I was drawn to them. Naruto said while scratching the back of his head. That's okay, my boy. It's good to see you are interested in history. Mr. Brunner replied with a small smile on his face. Come on now, you must be hungry. As the two were about to leave, Naruto had one last look at the exhibit and saw two more notable figures. A woman dressed in battle armor, and a man with winged sandals and a helmet carrying a staff with two snakes wrapped around it. For the second time today, he felt like he was supposed to know something, but his mind couldn't wrap around it, so he just shrugged it off and headed out. During lunch, the class gathered at the steps of the museum as they watched traffic zip by across Fifth Avenue. Overhead, storm clouds were brewing which the three just figured it was global warming or something. Despite the terrible weather, their other classmates do not seem to notice it. The trio sat on the edge of a fountain eating their lunch when Grover asked, detention. Nah, Percy said, not from Brunner. I just wish he would lay off me sometimes. I mean, I'm not a genius unlike our friend here. Percy said looking at Naruto who was slurping on his fifth cup of instant ramen he brought just for the trip. Naruto just let out a burp, and Grover just shrugged and said, can I have your apple? To which Naruto chuckled. The three looked over to their classmates who were pelting poor pigeons with crackers. One frizzy, red-headed girl was pickpocketing a pedestrian. A few minutes later, Nancy and her friends came over to the trio and decided to dump her lunch on Grover. Oops, she said while said with a grin, trying to avoid the glare that Naruto was giving her. Percy was so angry that he stood up like he was to pick another fight, but he heard a wave roar in his ears. Then, all of a sudden, Nancy was in the fountain making a loud and audible splash catching the attention of everyone, especially one Mrs. Dodds. The whole class whispered amongst themselves. Did you see? The water, like it was grabbing her. Mrs. Dodds materialized next to them, with triumphant look in her eyes. Naruto couldn't believe how fast she got there. He didn't even see her walk towards them. Mr. Jackson, come with me. Mrs. Dodds said. No it was me. I pushed her. Grover quickly said. 
I don't think so, Mr. Underwood. Mrs. Dodds replied as he glared at Grover which scared the boy to death. But, Grover tried to say something else but he was cut off by Mrs. Dodds. You will stay here. It's okay, Grover. Thanks for trying. Percy comforted. As the two were leaving, Grover was looking at Percy and Mr. Brunner back and forth hoping that the latter would notice. Grover yelped when Naruto patted his shoulder and asked, What's the matter, Grover? Why were you trying to cover for Percy? And why the pale look on your face? I, Grover couldn't answer causing Naruto to just stand up. Wait, where are you going? Grover asked when he saw Naruto stand up. Bathroom, Naruto quickly replied. Inside the museum. Naruto went out of the bathroom only to hear screaming coming from a part of the museum. That sounds like Percy. He said to himself, I'd recognize that scream anywhere. Naruto bounded toward the sound of Percy's scream only to run into him trying to run away from something. Geez Purse, what's, Naruto was cut off when he saw what Percy was running from. Where is it? A strange bat-like creature with long talons and leathery wings asked with a scratchy voice. I won't ask again. Purse, what the hell is that thing talking about? Naruto said while he was standing up. He held a stance with one arm behind his back and the other arm in front of him in a, come, gesture. I I don't, Percy stuttered. The creature lunged obviously targeting Percy. Percy braced himself for the worse when he heard his friend behind him shout. Wind style, great breakthrough, Naruto shouted as he breathed out wind from his mouth causing the creature to be sent back flying the opposite direction. Naruto, what was, Percy was cut off when he heard a shriek coming from the other direction. They saw the creature standing up again when they heard the familiar wheelchair of Mr. Brunner wheeling in towards their direction. What ho, Percy, Naruto. Mr. Brunner threw two objects which elongated and became weapons. Naruto snatched two kunai out of the air. These pair of weapons oddly has three blades instead on one and was in a perfect mix of black, silver and bronze. Percy, on the other hand, caught a medium-length, double-bladed sword which he immediately recognized. They didn't have time marvel at their newly acquired weapon when the creature shouted, you will pay for that. Mrs. Dodds lunged again shouting, die honeys. Naruto, who was quick on his feet, charged the creature. It did not have time to react when Naruto jumped in front of him and sliced at the creature's side and delivered a drop kick right at its head. Percy. Naruto shouted to his friend. Percy, who was stunned by all he was seeing, jumped into action as he saw the creature falling to the ground making small cracks at the sight of impact. Percy charged the creature and slashed across its chest as it struggled to stand up again. The creature vaporized on the spot and exploded to yellow powder, leaving the stench of sulfur in the air. The two boys looked in shock at the aftermath of what transpired. Naruto walked up to Percy and asked, what was that thing? T that was Mrs. Dodds. Percy managed to stutter out to the shock of Naruto. What was that just now, the thing you shouted? Percy asked. Believe me, you wouldn't even believe me if I told you. Naruto replied. So Naruto explained to Percy where he came from only adding to the shock of Percy. Naruto made Percy promise to keep everything that transpired to himself. Both boys were shocked again to find that Mr. Brunner was not there again, so they just shrugged and blamed everything on their imagination and decided to leave. Back at the entrance of the museum, Grover was still sitting in the same spot where they were. Clearly, he something was scaring him. Beside him, Nancy Bobofit was still standing there grumbling something to her friends. I hope Mrs. Kerr whipped your butt, she said when he saw the two boys approach. Both boys were puzzled with the mention of the new name, so Percy asked, who? Our teacher. Duh. Nancy replied clearly annoyed. Percy just had a puzzled look on his face. Nancy got even more annoyed so she just rolled her eyes and walked away with her friend. She took one last look back at the blonde who was glaring at her, and she ran away with a blush clearly visible on her cheeks causing her friends to run after her. They asked Grover where Mrs. Dodds was and who was Mrs. Kerr. At first Grover stared at them and laughed nervously like the two boys were saying some sort of joke. Then, he said, who? Without looking them in the eye. Not funny, man. Naruto said, this is serious. They saw Mr. Brunner on his wheelchair like he had never moved out of his spot. They decided to approach him. As the two boys approached, Mr. Brunner looked up a little distracted, are oh, those would be my pens. Please bring your own writing utensils in the future, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Uzumaki. It was Naruto who decided to ask. 
Sir, where is Mrs. Dodds? He stared blankly at the two boys and replied, Who? The other chaperone, Mrs. Dodds. The pre-algebra teacher, Percy said. He frowned and said, Percy, Naruto, there is no Mrs. Dodds on this trip. As far as I know, there has never been a Mrs. Dodds in Yancey Academy. Are you boys feeling all right? Both boys just nodded even more bewildered than before. That just left both boys with more questions than answers. Naruto had experience doing pranks. He was practically an expert when it comes to these things, but he couldn't wrap his mind around this incident. It had been weeks since that little incident happened in the museum. Naruto and Percy had been going from student to student to ask if they knew anything about Mrs. Dodds, but every student they asked just looked at them as if they had gone insane. It's just like the whole school was in on a little secret, and they were keeping Naruto and Percy in the dark. However, there was one person who could not convince them that they were just imagining things. Every so often, they would spring a Mrs. Dodds reference in their classmates, just to see if they could trip them up, but to no avail. Well, except for one Grover Underwood. Grover couldn't keep up the ruse. He would hesitate when asked, and then he would claim she never existed. This made him think. Something had happened in the museum. The weather worsened as days went by, as did Percy's mood. One night, a thunderstorm blew open the windows in the dorm room. A few days later, the biggest tornado ever was spotted in the Hudson Valley touched down only 50 miles from the school. One of the current events they studied in social studies was the unusual amount of planes that went down in the Atlantic this year. Grover and Naruto started to feel worried about their friend. Percy started feeling cranky and irritable. He got into more fights with Nancy and her friends, especially when Naruto was not around. Also, even with the blonde's help, Percy's grades slipped from C's and D's to F's. Finally, when Mr. Nickel asked Percy for the millionth time why he was too lazy to study for spelling tests, Percy snapped. He called him an old sot. Naruto was really pissed that the teacher didn't know how to handle the children with special needs, but he decided to keep it to himself. The headmaster sent a letter to his mom the following week. Percy was not invited back to Yancey Academy for the next year, but Percy didn't mind. Naruto figured he was feeling homesick and wanted to see his mom again. Days passed more and more and exam week got closer. Naruto, as usual, was burying himself in books studying for every subject he had in school. Percy, on the other hand, only studied Latin, since Mr. Brunner is his favorite teacher, of course with help from his blonde friend. On the night before the exam, Naruto was just lying on his bed resting his head from the tough week of getting ready for their exams. Percy was still trying to study. According to Percy, the words kept swimming across the page and circling around his head. He got so frustrated that he threw his book across the room. He paced the room as Naruto watched him walk back and forth. Need help. Naruto offered. I would love to, but I hate to mess up your concentration, and I know your head hurts from all that studying. Naruto smiled that his friend was still thinking of him even though he needed help himself. Naruto thought for a while and said, how about we go ask Mr. Brunner for help? I'll even go with you. Will he be willing to help? Of course. He is a teacher after all. Besides, I need a walk to stretch my muscles a bit. And so Naruto and Percy made their way to Mr. Brunner's office. In the hallways of Yancey Academy. Naruto and Percy walked through the hallways of the school on the way to Mr. Brunner's office. They saw most of them were dark and empty. Well, except for one. Mr. Brunner's door was ajar and light from the room was seeping through the window. When they were both about three steps from the door, they heard a voice who was definitely Grover say, worried about Percy and Naruto, sir. Both of them were surprised at the mention of the names. What's more, they were wondering why Grover was worried about them. Usually, it would be them who would be worried about Grover because of the constant bullying. Curiosity got the better of them, so they leaned in closer to listen in. Alone this summer, Grover was saying, I mean a kindly one in the school. Now, that we know for sure, and they know too. We would only make things worse by rushing them. Mr. Brunner said, we need Percy to mature more, and besides, I'm not really sure about Naruto. He is very mysterious, I'm not sure of what to make of him. Naruto eyes widened. Do they know who I am? How did they figure it out? He said internally. But they may not have time, especially Percy. The summer solstice deadline will have to be resolved without them, Grover. 
let Percy enjoy his ignorance while he still can, and keep Naruto in the dark along with him. Sir, they saw her. Their imagination, Mr. Brunner insisted. The mist over the students and the staff will be enough to convince them of that. The mist, Naruto thought. He looked at Percy who had the same dumbfounded look on his face. But they have been asking question after question. I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. You have to Grover. I know they have become your friends during your time here, but this will keep them safe. Sir, I, I can't fail in my duties again. Grover's voice cracked with emotion. You know what that would mean. You haven't failed, Grover. Mr. Brunner said kindly. I should have seen her for what she was. Now let's just worry about keeping him alive until next fall. Thud. Percy dropped his mythology book which caused Mr. Brunner to fall silent. Shit. Naruto said as he grabbed Percy and the mythology book with one swift motion and silently disappeared into one janitor's closets close by. Clop, clop, clop. Naruto and Percy could hear what he thought were hoof sounds on the floor, then a sound like an animal shuffling right outside the door. They could see a large dark shape paused in front of the door and stopped. Naruto sat there with a hand over Percy's mouth to prevent him from making a sound. Somewhere in the hallway, Mr. Brunner spoke. Nothing, he murmured. My nerves haven't been right since winter solstice. My neither, Grover said. But I could have sworn. Go back to the dorm. Mr. Brunner told Grover. You've got a long day of exams tomorrow. Grover sighed. Don't remind me. The lights went out in Mr. Brunner's office. Naruto and Percy waited until they were sure no one was outside, which seemed like forever. They went back to the dorm where to find Grover lying on the bed like he has been there all night. Sup G-man. Naruto and Percy said at the same time. Hey guys. Grover greeted back, but he frowned when he saw the look on Percy's face. Geez Perce, you look awful. Is everything alright? Just, tired, Percy managed to say. Percy immediately turned away so Grover couldn't read his expression. Naruto studied Percy. He knew that what they heard a while back was getting to him. It bugged him too. He couldn't understand what kind of danger they were talking about. The next day, Naruto, after finishing the Latin, had a big smile on his face, obviously confident that he did well. Percy, on the other hand, looked like he suffered through the exam he was taking. The letters, as usual, were swimming off the page, and he was reeling from all the Greek and Roman names he had misspelled. Naruto saw Percy walk out of the door only to hear Mr. Brunner call him back inside to talk to him. Before Percy walked back in, they looked at each other worried that they may have found out about the eavesdropping they did yesterday. Naruto channeled Chakra to his ears so he could listen in. Percy, he said, don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey Academy. It's, it's for the best. He heard that Mr. Brunner's tone was kind but he could just imagine what Percy might feel like hearing those words from his favorite teacher. Percy's not going to like that. He said to himself. Okay sir. Percy managed to mumble out a reply. I mean, Mr. Brunner struggled to find the words to say. This isn't the right place for you. It was only a matter of time. Right, he said back with a trembling voice. No, no, Mr. Brunner said. Oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say, you're not normal Percy. That is nothing to be. Thanks, Percy blurted out. Thanks for reminding me. Naruto heard Percy begin to walk out. He saw the door open and saw Percy with a long face. He patted his friend on the back before walking back in to talk to Mr. Brunner and say his goodbyes to their favorite teacher. He saw Mr. Brunner contemplating on the things he said to Percy. That could have gone better, Mr. Brunner. Percy looks like he had an earful from you. Naruto said as he approached their teacher. Hmm, yes, Mr. Brunner nodded as he saw Naruto. Perhaps I may have been too hard on him. You just wanted the best for him. He will understand eventually, Naruto replied earning a look of appreciation from Mr. Brunner. Yes, well, how about you, Mr. Uzumaki? Will you be returning here next year? I don't think so Mr. Brunner. Since Percy isn't coming back again, I might go to where he would transfer and keep him company, maybe keep him out of trouble too. Mr. Brunner nodded, you're a good friend Naruto. Percy and Grover are lucky to have you looking out for them. Naruto smiled, thanks Mr. Brunner for everything. I guess I'll see you around. They shook hands and said the goodbyes before Naruto headed out. Last day of the term. Naruto and Percy packed their bags getting ready to go home.
Percy contacted his mom in order to let her know that Naruto might be spending the summer with them since he lived alone. They headed out once they made sure they didn't leave anything. As they made their way out, they could see everyone staring at him, more particularly at Naruto. It looks like he made quite the impression on his schoolmates. The girls watched them go out sadly knowing that the blonde was not coming back to the school next year. Both boys couldn't care less about anyone else about the others, but they dreaded saying goodbye to their best friend, Grover. It turned out, though, that he booked a ticket on the same Greyhound as the two, so they were together again, heading for the city. During the whole bus ride, Grover was fidgety, and glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers as if worrying about bullies as usual. Finally, Percy leaned over to Grover and whispered, looking for kindly ones. Naruto saw what Percy did so he leaned over to listen in. Grover nearly jumped out of his seat. Why well, what do you mean? We kinda listened in on your conversation with Mr. Brunner. Naruto confided, while Percy nodded. Oh, not much, Naruto said. What's the summer solstice deadline? Percy asked out of curiosity. He winced. Look Percy, Naruto, I was worried about you too, see. I mean, hallucinating about demon math teachers. Grover. Percy tried to cut him off. And I was just telling Mr. Brunner that maybe you were overstressed or something, because there was no such person as Mrs. Dodds, and... Grover, man, you're a really bad liar. Naruto said pointing to Grover's ears. Whenever you lie, you get all flustered and your ears turn pink. From his shirt pocket, he fished out grubby business cards and gave one to each of his friends. Just take these, okay. In case you need me this summer. The card was in fancy script which was murder to Percy's eyes, but Naruto was able to read it. The card said, Grover U-N-D-E-R-W-O-O-R. Keeper. Half-Blood Hill. Long Island, New York. 800-0009-0009. Hmm, fancy he he he, Naruto said. What's half? Shush. Don't say it out loud. He yelped. That's my summer address. Percy was upset from hearing that, while Naruto was just surprised. They never considered Grover to be rich like the other snobby kids back at Yancey. Okay, Percy said glumly. So, like, if I wanted to visit your mansion. Grover nodded, or, or if you need me. Why would I need you? Percy asked. Naruto was just silent about the whole thing not sure about how he should make of this, until he heard Percy say that. Geez Perse, go easy on the guy. Grover blushed right down to his Adam's apple, look Percy, Naruto, I I kinda have to protect you. They just stared at him until they heard a grinding noise under their feet. Black smoke poured out of the dashboard, and the stench of rotting eggs permeated through the whole bus. The driver cursed and limped the greyhound to the side of the highway. The passengers groaned in disappointment at what happened. The driver went out to the engine compartment and started clanking at the engine to try and get it to work. After a few minutes of no success in tinkering with the engine, the driver announced that everyone should get off the bus. They were stopped at a stretch of country road, no place you'd notice if you didn't break down there. On their side of the highway, there was nothing but maple trees and litter from passing cars. On the other side, across four lanes of asphalt shimmering with afternoon heat was an old-fashioned fruit stand. On the stand were heaping boxes of blood-red cherries and apples, walnuts and apricots, jugs of cider in a clawfoot tub full of ice. There were no customers, just three old ladies sitting under the shade of the maple trees, knitting the biggest pair of socks anyone has ever seen. The socks were the size of sweaters, but you would never mistake them to be sweaters. Clearly, they were socks. The lady on the right knitted one of them. The lady on the left knitted the other. The lady in the middle helped an enormous basket filled with electric blue yarn. All three women looked ancient, with pale faces wrinkled like fruit leather, silver hair tied in white bandanas, bony arms sticking out of bleached cotton dresses. That weirdest thing was they were looking straight at Percy. The blood on Grover's face drained and his nose was twitching. A uh, Grover, Naruto tried to call Grover's attention. Percy, tell me they're not looking at you. They are, aren't they? Yeah, weird huh? You think those socks would fit me? Naruto just chuckled. Not funny Percy. Not funny at all. The old lady in the middle took out a huge pair of gold and silver, long-bladed scissors, like shears. Both boys heard Grover gasp as if catching his breath. Grover pulled both boys by their arms. Come on, we're getting on the bus. Hey watch it. Both boys said at the same time. As they were about to go, 
The middle one cut the yarn which the trio heard across the four lanes of traffic. The other two balled up the electric blue socks, leaving Percy and Naruto wondering for who it might be. At the rear end of the bus, the driver wrenched a big chunk of smoking metal out of the engine compartment. Surprisingly, the bus shuddered and the engine roared it back to life. The passengers cheered. Darn right, the driver yelled. He slapped the bus with his hat. Everybody back on board. Naruto noticed that Percy was feverish as if he got the flu and Grover was shivering and his teeth were chattering. Uh, Grover. Naruto asked. Yeah. What are you not telling us? Grover dabbed his forehead with his shirt sleeve. What did you guys see at the fruit stand? You mean the old ladies? Percy asked. What about them? They're not like, like Mrs. Dodds are they? Grover's expression was hard to read, but Naruto and Percy had a feeling that it was something. He said, Jay just tell me what you saw. The middle one took out her scissors, and she cut the yarn. Percy said. Grover closed his eyes and made a gesture with his fingers. Naruto thought that he might have been crossing himself, but it wasn't. It was something much older. You saw her snip the cord. Grover said starting to panic. Yeah, so. Percy asked but there was no answer from his friend. This is not happening. Grover mumbled. He started chewing at his thumb. I don't want this to be like the last time. What last time? Naruto asked. Still Grover didn't answer. Always the sixth grade. They never get past the sixth grade. Let me walk you home from the bus station. Promise me. Grover said to both boys. Both boys nodded at his odd request. Is this like a superstition or something? Percy asked. Still no answer. Grover, does the snipping of the yarn mean someone is going to die? Grover looked at both boys mournfully, like he was already picking which flowers would work best at their funeral. The rest of the trip was silent. Nobody dared to say anything else. Naruto studied his two friends. Percy was visibly shaken by what happened and Grover kept mumbling to himself about some kind of failure he had in the past. Naruto just thought. Grover, what are you hiding? Rush up on Greek mythology. This rang throughout Naruto's mind all throughout the bus ride. His adoptive mother told him to do this when he got to this world. At first, he thought nothing of it thinking that his mother just wanted to share one of her hobbies to him, but now, he wasn't so sure about it. He sat on the bus thinking about the things that happened so far. He remembered the attack of Mrs. Dodds, the bat-like creature, to which he remembered, was a fury. He also remembered that every time he took a whiff of Grover, he smelled like goat, making him remember reading about a breed then, just recently, there were the three old ladies who were weaving a huge sock with electric blue yarn to the list of weird. He tried to think about where in Greek mythology he read about them. It's them, isn't it? He believe it. Could it be? It couldn't be a coincidence. Naruto, we're here. Percy called Naruto's attention. With all the thinking Naruto was doing this whole trip, he didn't even notice they have arrived at the destination. He noticed Grover was still mumbling, why does this always happen? And, why does it always have to be the sixth grade? To himself as they made their way out of the bus. When they got off the bus, Grover said, guys, promise me that you will wait for me here, with hands of his pants jumping. Promise, Percy said, but Naruto was just silent still thinking about all the things that happened. He made a beeline to the nearest restroom without waiting for Naruto's response. Instead of waiting, Percy pulled Naruto outside. Wait, Percy, didn't you promise Grover that he could walk you home? We shouldn't do this to him. Naruto protested. Look Naruto, I know this is rude to him, but I want to see my mom now. So, just choose, either come with me or wait for Grover. Naruto was torn between the two of them. He keeps Kakashi's teaching, those who break the rules are scum, but those who abandon their friends are even worse than scum, to heart, but he didn't want to leave either of them. Damn it, Naruto thought. Just a second, then. He ran to an empty alleyway and made the hand signs. Shadow clone jutsu. Keep an eye on Grover, I don't want him to get hurt or anything. Dispel when you think the time is right and do not let anyone, including Grover, see you. The clone nodded. He made a half ram hand sign, and disappeared in a cloud of smoke. The real Naruto ran back to Percy. What did you do? Percy asked. I made a clone to keep an eye on and follow Grover. Naruto answered. Percy just left it at that, since he wanted to go home as soon as possible. Percy and Naruto caught the first taxi they could get to Naruto and Percy's apartment. 
Percy and Sally's apartment. Percy opened the door to a revolting sight. He saw Gabe playing poker with his friends. The television blared ESPN, but nobody was watching. Chips and beer cans were strewn over the carpet. Gabe Ugliano is Percy's stepfather. Right now, he looked like a tuskless walrus in thrift store clothes, and he reeked of moldy pizza wrapped in gym shorts. He had three strands of hair on his head all combed over his bald scalp like it made him famous or something. He managed an electronics mega mart in Queens, but stayed home most of the time. Despite that, he kept on collecting paychecks and spent them on beer and cigars. Naruto and Percy walked in the house. Gabe seemed to notice them. Hardly looking up, he said, so, you're home, and I see that blonde punk is here again. Where's my mom? Percy asked. Working, he said. You got any cash? Naruto glared at Gabe. He knew the drill. Gabe expected Percy to provide his gambling money calling it the, guy secret. I don't have any cash, Percy told him. Gabe raised a greasy eyebrow. He didn't believe him. He, like a bloodhound, could sniff money from a mile away, which was surprising since his own smell should have covered up everything else. You took a taxi from the bus station, he said. Probably paid with a twenty. Got six or seven bucks in change. Somebody expect to live under this roof, he ought to carry his own weight. Am I right, Eddie? Eddie, the super of the apartment building looked at Percy with sympathy. Come on Gabe, the kid just got here. Come on, Gabe, the kid just got here. Am I right? Gabe repeated firmly this time. Before Percy was about move when Naruto, who during his days in Yancey Academy done a lot of training with Genjustu, put a hand on Percy's shoulder and whispered on his ear, wait, don't. I'm going to play some mind games on him. He cast an illusion on Gabe and his friends, Naruto made all of them on the poker table see Percy dig out a wad of cash from his pocket and threw the money on the table and say, I hope you lose. Percy and Naruto turned around to go to the former's room. On their way to the room, they heard Gabe say, your report card came in brain boy. They didn't hear what Gabe said because they slammed the door to Percy's room. Well, it wasn't really Percy's room. During school days, it was Gabe's study, but he didn't study anything except old car magazines. He just loved to shove Percy's stuff in closets, leaving muddy boots on the windowsill, and do his best to make the room smell like his nasty cologne, stale beer and cigars. Percy dropped his suitcase on the bed while Naruto left his by the wall. Both of them had things on their mind. Percy had the look of fear on his face as he remembered Grover's look of panic when he made the both of them promise that he would walk the two boys to the house. Naruto, on the other hand, couldn't shake the thoughts he had off his mind. It was bothering him. Then, both boys heard a female voice call out to them. Percy. Naruto. She opened the door to see both boys sitting on the bed. This is Sally Jackson, Percy's mother and, according to him, the best person in the world. Her own parents died when she was five, and she was adopted by her uncle who didn't care much for her. Naruto's respect for her grew when he learned that she was still pursuing her dream to be a novelist, which at the moment she was nowhere near achieving. It made him remember his old dream of becoming Hockage. All her life, it seemed that misfortune followed her, but she got a break when he met Percy's dad. She didn't like talking about him that much because it makes her sad, and Percy didn't have a lot of memories of him, only the faintest glow of a smile. They weren't married and their relationship was a secret. Then, one day, he left for an important journey and never came back. Sally termed it as, lost at sea. She raised Percy all by herself, which wasn't easy, but she never complained, not even once. She worked odd jobs and took night classes to get a high school diploma. What puzzled Naruto was why Sally married Gabe and continued to stay with him despite the way he treats her. When she first met Naruto, her heart just melted when she learned that he was just like her. She learned that Naruto was living by himself. She was relieved when she learned that Naruto was supported by his adoptive mother. She also offered Naruto to be his guardian to which he gladly accepted, and ever since, Naruto has been coming over, much to Gabe's annoyance. So, Sally entered the room, and immediately hugged both of them. Oh Percy, I can't believe it. You've grown since Christmas, she said. And Naruto, I hope you love the candies I sent you. Today, she was wearing her sweets on America uniform which smelled like chocolate, licorice and other candies she brought from their store at the Grand Central Station. Just like always, she brought home a huge bag of free samples. 
They sat on the edge of the bed while Percy attacked the blueberry sour strings and Naruto ate the orange gummies. She ran her fingers through the boy's hair and demanded to know everything the two didn't put in the letters. She didn't mention anything about Percy's expulsion like she didn't care about it. She cared more about her two boys' well-being. Percy complained that she was smothering both of them, but secretly, he was really, really glad to see her. Sally saw a tear drop from Naruto's eyes. Naruto, are you okay? She asked. Why yeah, it's just this stuff is new to me. Sally smiled and wiped Naruto's tear with her finger. From the other room, Gabe shouted, Hey Sally. How about some bean dip, huh? Percy and Naruto frowned. For her sake, Percy and Naruto tried to sound upbeat as they told her everything that happened. Percy started to choke up and Naruto felt sad when they remembered Grover and Mr. Brunner. When they made it to the museum trip, Percy looked at each with fear in their eyes. What? Did something scare you? She tried to tug at their conscience, trying to extract the secrets from them. No mom, no Aunt Sally. The two boys felt bad for lying, but she just pursed her lips. She didn't push them. I have a surprise for you, she said. We're going to the beach. Montic. Percy asked, his ask sparkling. Three nights, same cabin. When? Right after I get changed. Naruto, you're always welcome to come. Oh. Um, Naruto stammered. I is it okay? I might be in the way. No no Naruto, not at all. She said moving her hands through Naruto's whisker marks, which tickled him. All right then. Naruto decided. Gabe appeared at the door and growled, Bean dip, Sally. Didn't you hear me? Percy looked like he wanted to punch Gabe and Naruto had his fists clenched while trying to control his temper. Sally's looked at both boys. The look on her face was saying, Be nice to Gabe for a little while. Just until we leave for Montic. I was on my way honey. She told Gabe. We were just talking about the trip. Gabe's eyes got small. The trip. You were serious about that. I knew it. Percy muttered. He won't let us go. Of course he will. Sally said. Your stepfather was just worried about money. That's all. Besides, she added, Gabriel won't have to settle for bean dip. I'll make him enough seven layer dip for the whole weekend. Guacamole, sour cream. The works. Gabe softened a bit, so this money for the trip, it comes out of your clothes budget, right? Yes honey, Sally said. And you won't take my car anywhere but there and back. We'll be very careful. Gabe scratched his double chin. Maybe if you hurry with that seven layer dip, and maybe if the kid apologizes for interrupting my poker game. Percy and Naruto tried their hardest not to snicker since they remembered the illusion Naruto casted. The former just managed to mumble out, I'm sorry I interrupted your incredibly important poker game. Please go back to it right now. Gabe's eyes narrowed. His tiny brain was probably trying to detect the sarcasm Percy used. Yeah, whatever, he decided. He took a look at Naruto and asked, is Blondie coming too? Yes, of course honey. Sally answered. Gabe just nodded, probably just glad that the blonde wasn't staying in their house. He shuddered when he remembered the blonde wiping him clean of money when he let him join the poker game. Thank you, Percy, my mom said. Once we get to Montic, we'll talk more about whatever you've forgotten to tell me, okay? For a moment, there was fear in her eyes, the same fear they saw Grover had at the bus, but her smile returned. She ruffled both boys' hair and went to make Gabe seven layer dip. After an hour, they were ready to leave. Gabe took a break from his poker game to watch the boys lug the bags to the car. He kept groaning about losing Sally's cooking and, more importantly, his 1978 Camaro for the whole weekend. Not a scratch blondie, he warned as the last bag was loaded, not one little scratch. He normally saves that for me, Percy said. Both shrugged at that. Gabe made his way up to the apartment. Naruto made a half-ram seal and released the illusion. After that, both of them climbed in the Camaro. Naruto made a request to stop by his apartment to get some stuff before they went on their way. As the car drove off, one could hear a gay Bugliano shout out in rage. Where's my money? Montic Beach. When they arrived at the rental cabin at sunset, Sally and Percy's faces seemed to light up. It was located at the south shore, way out at the tip of Long Island. It was a little pastel box with faded curtains, half sunken in the dunes. There was always sand in the sheets and spiders in the cabinets, and most of the time, the sea was too cold to swim in. Despite the simple style, they both loved it. 
Percy and Sally started the usual cleaning routine to which they showed Naruto. They walked on the beach, fed blue and orange corn chips to the seagulls, and munched on a variety of blue and orange candies Sally had brought from work. Why blue and orange food you ask? Well, for the blue food, Gabe and Sally had a fight about blue food not existing. Ever since then, Sally went out of her way to cook and bake blue food from cakes to corn chips to smoothies. When Naruto came along, he got curious about all the blue food that Sally makes and Percy explained to him why. Naruto requested Sally if she could make some orange food to which Sally happily agreed. When it got dark, they made a fire. Sally was impressed that Naruto could make a fire so easily. Naruto just said he went camping a lot as a kid. Sally told them stories about the books she wanted to write someday, when she had enough money to quit the shop. Eventually, Percy asked Sally what was always on his mind whenever they went to Montic, his father. Sally's eyes went misty. He was kind, she said, tall, handsome, and powerful, but gentle too. You his black hair, you know and his green eyes. Sally fished out a blue jelly bean out of her candy bag. I wish he could see you, Percy. He would be so proud. How old was I? Percy asked, when he left. He was only with me for one summer, Percy, right at this beach, this cabin. Sally watched the flames as she explained. But, he knew me as a baby. No, honey. He knew I was expecting a baby, but he never saw you. He had to leave when you were born. There was a moment of silence. Sally cleared her throat. What about you Naruto? What were your parents like? On the first week he was this world, he wondered what his parents were like. One day, he received another note describing his parents. Today, he was giving the short version of what he read. Well, they say I look like my dad. He never knew who his mother was, so he was raised by his father. He grew up a genius. He was what you call a prodigy. He became a soldier and eventually a war hero. Through this he managed to become a pretty big deal in our village. As for my mother, they say I got her personality. She had a round face and red hair, which always got her teased. She never knew who his father was, so she was raised by her mother. She was mischievous growing up, always pranking people. She was a target for bullies, but she never backed down from them. Do you have any pictures of them? Percy asked. Naruto just shook his head. There was a moment of silence again. Percy broke the silence when he asked, are you going to send me away again to another boarding school? She pulled a marshmallow from the fire. I don't know, honey. Her voice was heavy. I think, I think we'll have to do something. Because you don't want me around. Naruto just face palmed internally at the density of his friend. He didn't know why his friend couldn't see that it was hard enough for his mom as it is. There were tears in Sally's eyes as she took Percy's hand. Oh Percy, no. I I have to, honey, for your own good. Because I'm not normal, Percy said. You say as if it's a bad thing, Percy, but you don't realize how important you are. I thought Yancey Academy was far away enough. I thought you'd finally be safe. Safe from what? Percy remembered all the weird and scary things that happened when he was a child. Some of which he tried to forget. Naruto remembered the conversation Mr. Brunner and Grover had. I've tried to keep you as close to me as I could, Sally said. They told me that was a mistake. But there's only one other option, Percy, the place your father wanted to send you. And I just, I just can't stand to do it. They, who are, they? He asked himself not wanting to interrupt their conversation. My father wanted me to go to a special school. Not a school, she said softly. A summer camp. I'm sorry, Percy, she said, seeing the look in my eyes. But I can't talk about it. I, I couldn't send you to that place. It might mean saying goodbye to you for good. For good. But if it's only a summer camp. She turned toward the fire, and Naruto knew from her expression that if Percy had asked her any more questions she would start to cry. Naruto didn't know what to say in this situation. He felt like intruding in a private conversation, so he just enjoyed the moonlit night which reminded him of those missions that he had with Team 7. Percy decided not to ask any more questions seeing that his mother was about to cry. The three, then, called it a night. That night it was storming hard, and the three woke up with a start. The storm had woken up Sally when a thunder boomed overhead. Percy was awoken by his weird dream he was having about two animals, a white horse and a golden eagle, were fighting and a monstrous voice fighting in the background. Naruto's eyes shot open up when the memories of the clone that followed Grover flooded his mind. 
What was notable was the latter parts of the memories particularly the area it had seen. It was the area they drove through on the way here. Naruto jumped out of bed and opened the door to see Grover was about to knock. Grover was panting. Searching all night. What were you thinking? Naruto stuttered while scratching the back of his head. Um, Percy made me do it. Sally looked in terror not at Grover, but at the reason of why he'd come. Percy, she said, shouting to be heard over the rain. What happened at school? What didn't you tell me? Percy was frozen, looking at Grover. Oziukai Aloy Theoi. He yelled. It's right behind me. Didn't you tell her? Naruto and Percy were shocked to register that Grover cursed in ancient Greek, and they understood it perfectly. They were too shocked to wonder what trouble Grover had gotten himself into now. My mom looked at both boys sternly and talked in a tone she'd never used before, Percy, Naruto. Tell me now. Naruto and Percy stammered while they took turns explaining about the three old ladies with electric blue yarn and Mrs. Dodds. Her face turned deathly pale in the flashes of lightning. Sally grabbed her purse, tossed Naruto and Percy their rain jacket, and said, all of you. Get in the car. Now. All three ran to the car, but Grover wasn't exactly running, he was trotting, shaking his shaggy hindquarters. It hit Naruto like a bullet, the goat scent of Grover, the way he could run but still limp when he walked because, on the lower half of Grover's body, were cloven hooves. I it can't be. He said to himself, that will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.